Welcome back, everyone, to another issue of Macro Matters. Uh, my name is Rich Excel, and I am joined once again by my colleague, Tony Zhang. Tony, welcome back. It's been a while since we got together, but uh, it's good to be back. Yes, yeah, definitely, Rich. Uh, just so uh, so glad that we are able to come um, on Monday morning to actually have this recording, um, especially during the time to when the tech um actually tumbled last week and a lot of people uh questioning that what had happened and what might be the indication for the coming um coming weeks so i think this is a great moment for us to come and discuss yeah this is definitely a great time to talk about it because i think um you know when we were thinking about setting up the the macro matters and i know we haven't done this in a couple of weeks initially i was thinking we would do one early before earnings started and do one when in the middle of earnings and and earnings have started, and we've seen that with the banks and some other players. Um, and at the large cap side, the earnings have been actually pretty decent. Um, right. Not great, but the stocks haven't necessarily responded favorably. But on the small caps, the, the earnings have been pretty poor, poor at this point. But I don't think that's what's really taken the market down yet. I mean, we have a big week of tech earnings ahead of us here, but it's really been more of the macro issues that have been taking the market lower here. And I think that's what we wanted to talk about a little bit today, um, a lot of those that's factors. And I think... You know, it all starts with the Fed, right? This year, as we've been talking about in Macro Matters multiple times, this year is all about inflation and all about Fed expectations. And we've been talking about it for a couple of months now, it seems, that uh, we didn't think that there would be any uh, any rate cuts at all. And the market is slowly but surely coming, along, coming around to what we thought was going to happen. And now we look at it and, um, you know, depending on whether you look at the CME or Bloomberg, et cetera, you're, you're really only at about one rate cut for 2024 at this point, which I still think is too high, but that's okay. Um, and I think we saw that with the Fed speakers last week where Jay Powell said that, you know, inflation is not making progress um, towards their target. And so, you know, they're not going to be able to cut, you know, much more hawkish than the last time he spoke. And, and John Williams at the New York Fed, um, you know, went even a step further and said, if the data stays as it is, they might have to consider the possibility of a hike. I mean, he says it's not it's not his base case, but you know, I think that really that was enough to really freak people out a little bit, right? I mean, I I think if you're a a, a tech investor uh, focused on you know needing uh, you know higher higher growth multiples, et cetera, that that was a, enough to really spook some people. Definitely, definitely. At what we have uh, seen just right since the beginning of this year that we both of us continue to agree that there might not be as many costs as the market had anticipated. Market actually at the beginning of January, I think uh, has priced in like a forecast a year. And I bet, and later on, once we actually get into February that uh, you claim you call for no cost, I say, at maximum, there will be only one cut in June. If it is no cut in June, this is no no cut at all. So now here, it's like uh, I think by the end of a, uh, Friday, the market finally realized that because of the inflation and Federal Reserve has no other choice right now but to keep the high for longer policy uh, right now to rest continue to restate. And even though I think I think it's um uh William came out and claimed that maybe interest hike could be a possibility, but I, uh, from my end, there's, there's no such kind of possibility uh, either. But however, Mark, you finally realized that um, right now, the maximum likelihood for the cut will be just, uh, had went down from 1.9 earlier this, uh, this month to right now only 1.5 cut. Uh, for the rest of the year, which is basically saying that there's a maximum there will be only just one card rather than uh, more than more than once. And the one card right now, the market actually priced in that this is going to happen in September rather than in June. But as what we have continued to discuss, I think in September, uh, a time so close, so so close to the presidential election, most of the time Federal Reserve is not going to step in and take any action, uh, even at a moment that, even at a moment, this is, might be some uh, urgency to for the lower rate card, but they probably would not historically step in and take action just right before the presidential election. This is too dangerous uh, for them to take any move. So I, uh, 
tend to agree with you unless it's something like really big happen. For instance, something like <clears throat> like nuclear warming or other kind of a pandemic, like what we have experienced in year 2020. Is, right now, it's very unlikely that we are going to see a, a rate cut. The rest yeah, I agree, and and we're seeing we're seeing those effects across the treasury curve, not just in the short end, right? Clearly, yeah. the short end's been moving, but you know we're we've seen this to where we're getting a a steepening in the yield curve, but a bearish steepening because the ten year treasury yield is moving higher with bonds or when notes uh, treasury notes selling off. Um, we've we've broken above some technical levels at four fifty, and now we're around four sixty five, really with no resistance. Um, realistically until 5%, which was the high that we hit last summer. And it almost feels, feels like we're going to get a, a little bit of a repeat of that. Um, and, you know, there's a lot that goes into that, you know, with the fact that we've got these higher treasury yields is that we're at a period right now where the treasury itself is trying to issue about a trillion dollars of coupons over the next three months or three or four months. And, you know, and if you look at the largest foreign buyers, of um of u.s treasuries uh japan you're seeing its currency weaken considerably it's well above the intervention zones the uk is in recession in china um you know the u.s just put tariffs on chinese aluminum and steel so that doesn't really make it conducive to want china to want to buy and and we know the banks have been struggling under the weight of the bonds that they already own and so you really ask yourself who's going to be absorbing this 1.2 trillion of, of coupon issuance and that you know that could be retiring U.S. high net worth uh, retail accounts, but they've shown that they're pretty happy around 5% in cash. So okay. you have to get closer to 5% further out the curve to induce that uh, money to come in and buy bonds. And so I think when you look at it, we might be in a world of higher rates led by higher commodity prices from demand being a little bit higher in these products than we thought, but also sanctions, tariffs, et cetera. So the, you know, I think it's more than just inflation not falling back, as Jay Powell says. I think it's inflation actively moving higher, we've pointed out before. And this is causing problems in the treasury market, which is going to have ripple effects into the equity market. Yeah, Richard, you uh, pointed out, I think, uh, a couple of very interesting points. Uh, apparently, definitely from uh, uh, the macro perspective is that we see both geopolitical tension that cause, uh, I think, commodity price continue to increase. And simultaneously, the U.S. Um, governments actually need to continue to uh, maybe sell off more bonds. But the big question here at what you have claimed, now it used to be the U.S. Uh, citizens and high net worth individuals here in the institution in the U.S. Uh, saw like more than half of the, the U.S. treasury, treasury bond. But now, given the current condition with uh, the high interest rates just remaining high for longer, then apparently it's like they would extremely happy about four or five, four point two or five point two percent of the risk free rate. Now, the because the yield spread between even the, uh, I think the corporate bond and high yield corporate bond is very minimum, and simultaneously between um, the spread between the risky assets versus risk-free access is also very minimum. Now, this cons the appetites for the U.S. Con um, retail investor and though even for institution continue to absorb this kind of a uh, treasury yield, uh, long-term treasury bonds, uh, the appetite is actually declining. So that's why the U.S. governments had to rely on the foreign investor, foreign government institution to actually absorb the new release of the treasury bond. That's why they add, that's why uh, we see, I think the secretary uh, 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 Yellen actually went to China, went to China and trying to maybe uh, cool down, maybe some kind of a financial or economic tension between two major economic powers in the world. And, sim and simultaneously, you now they definitely want the Europe and other the rest of the uh, emerging market also maybe try to take over some of the additional uh, uh, bond issuance. Last week, I think eventually the House actually passed a bill for the foreign military aid 
to Ukraine. And this is all actually will continue to add it up to the U.S. government's um, debt uh, and budget deficits. Now, here comes really comes the issue with continuous continuous the issuance and we doubt at with high actually inflation. Now, how long can the U.S. government continue to sustain the, um, with this kind of a high interest payment? This is actually a very big question mark. Um, we have been discussing about the MMT, uh, I think, since the beginning of last year. Yeah. Just continue to emphasize that the, the the Federal Reserve or can continue in as like enlarge the balance sheet and the U.S. government can continue to actually raise the uh, the budget deficits like until a point that, that it's not going to hold. Now, I think that we probably might be getting close to that point at this moment. Yeah, I mean, even the advocates of MMT will tell you that the you know you you can do you can issue as much debt as you want it if you write if you print or you sorry if you are doing it in your own currency which is just you know which is a reserve currency. However, you stop when you see inflation, and I think yes. you saw that inflation, and they didn't really stop, and so I start starting to see a resurgence of that inflation. And then when we look at it, you mentioned the money going to Ukraine, and of course we've got some problems still in the Middle East. War is inflationary, right? Um, right. Energy transitions, as we're going through, energy transitions are inflationary, and right. too much debt is inflationary. And all of these things, you know, we'll look back here in a few years and say, well, we had all of those. Of course, it was going to be inflationary. And I think there are still plenty of people that will tell you that um, because of uh, maybe because of demographics, et cetera, um, that, that, you know, that there's going to be a, a pressure on this on the uh, on the longer term yields. And and I think that that's fair. We can look at that, though. I I would argue that maybe immigration changes that dynamic on demographics a little bit in some of these developed countries. Um, but I think right now, a lot of the impulses that we're seeing are all inflationary, not disinflationary, not deflationary. And that just means that higher for longer rates. And that means that we're going to the, the equity markets that have risen really since um, November of last year, entirely on multiples, not on earnings. Um, as investors were expecting rate cuts and a soft landing, um, you know, are going to have to deal with the fact that um, we aren't going to see rate cuts. Now, we talked about it last time that the equity risk markets have done pretty well holding up in the face of the rate cuts being priced out. But at this point, for equity markets to continue to move higher, you have to see earnings. And right now, um, across the board in the entire market, you're not seeing earnings. You're seeing them in the large, some of the large cap names that put up some decent earnings. But the small cap names really are struggling on the earnings front. And I think these are the companies that are really struggling start, uh, struggling under the weight of higher interest rates. And so I think the rest of the year in the equity market is going to have to be an earnings-led move higher in the market. And I think that's one where I think um, the hurdle rate is pretty high for tech stocks. The hurdle rate is pretty low for energy stocks. And so I think investors might have to um, reassess how they are positioned because we know investors are pretty heavily positioned in technology and not so much in energy. And so um, I think that's something to, that we're going to have to be dealing with here in the coming weeks. Oh, uh, certainly. Um, Richie, this is, I agree with you on the divergence between the large cap versus the small cap. And with the uh, Federal Reserve's high for longer interest rate policy, apparently the earning and revenue uh, growth for the small cap company remain to be very, um, I think, pessimistic. That's why many actually small cap companies and small cap company index was actually declining versus like large cap in index over the past couple of weeks. And this situation will actually continue to worse, uh, continue to get worse, uh, not even better uh, if. Federal Reserve actually did not cut uh, the rate until the end of this year, or maybe at the beginning of year 2025. Now we can we'll continue to see the uh, uh, the high inflation would dry up the cost for the small cap company, which actually have low capability to actually pass through the uh, increase the cost of the capital to the end mm -hmm. uh, consumer and end user, and well at the, at the same time. The most of the S and P 
like earning or revenue growth came from the large cap mm -hmm. company, which actually have apparently their monopoly power over the market and actually the dominant uh, capability to continue to uh, accumulate the uh, the cash and continue to uh, generate the growth from the consumer. For instance, like um, Meta, uh, Google, Amazon, I think they would uh, they're going to actually report earning. Uh, this week, um, which would and continue to anticipate, uh, for instance, like Meta uh, would report an astonish both revenue and unimpaired uh, growth. Um, that is fundamentally remain to be very very strong for this kind of large cap uh, company. Like this is the earning growth or even the earning per share. I I think this will become extremely difficult to see. In a small cap, especially like in some uh, sector like biotech, they continue to uh, go under tremendous pressures. It's like the the actual rebounds or return uh, from fundamental issue uh, actually uh, very very slim from my perspective. Now, uh, apparently later on, maybe if you're convenient, we can actually bring uh, on some maybe your curve. Um, uh, from the treasury bill, and we can actually continue to see that the yield curve, as what you pointed out, continues um, steepen. So both uh, long, uh, short end and long end, that's actually going to put a lot of pressures for small cap for way, way longer time than people would uh, traditionally uh, anticipate it. That's, um, I think right now the major issue for for the e U.S. economy. U.S. economy remain to be robust, given what we have seen from the initial jobless claim uh, data in release uh, recently, and the jobless claim remain to be very robust. But this is a lot of a uh, uh, reasons behind it, as what you explained, that could be caused some kind of uh, pause from the immigration um, for uh, immigrants, uh, etc. Et but we start, finally, we start to see the wage growth, which actually used to be one of the major factors behind the inflation, uh, actually start to soften. And most of the inflation now here comes from the energy and real estate price. Now, real estate price, we finally, I, I think finally real estate price in many regions within the U.S. start to soften as well, even though still in some region like uh, California, we remain to be strong. Now, the uh, major issue, one major issue still come from the um, energy and other commodity. The commodity, especially the industrial commodity, uh, continue to show strong and resilience uh, given the uh, the demand of the strong demand of economy and simultaneously the limited supply from those industrial uh, uh, commodity so i think the inflation we hear was uh, remains uh, still for longer than people might anticipate it. this is something that uh, really concern should get uh, more of the attention from the uh, investors yeah, I agree. And I just pull up the uh, the chart of the uh, the raw industrials index and we can see that not only is it uh, moving higher, it's moving higher at a, at a faster clip too, right? It's starting to really kind of break out here to on a, on a move to the upside um, after a period of time when it had fallen um, really. Um, and, and it was, you know, look at it, it had fallen from the peaks in 2022 all the way through the end of 2023 and has now started to turn the corner. And we've talked about that before. And, and, and this then, you know, for those that are looking at, on YouTube or if you're listening on podcasts, well, I'm just, you know, I'm bringing up the chart now of the of the two year, 10 year yield curve. And we can see that it is still inverted, but it is steepening. It's not quite to where it was um, last um, October um, when it got to the the steepest it was. Um, and, and that again, remember when it was steepening into the end of last October, that was a bad time for the equity markets. And so this re-steepening of the yield curve, which is taking the cuts out of um, out of the bond market is is not a healthy sign for risky assets. And so I think that's important to understand. Um, a couple other things I wanted to kind of point out as you were talking, Tony, is that here is the, uh, one of my favorite charts, the relative um, rotation graph, which looks at how the different sectors are performing in the market relative to the broader index. 
And what we can see is that um, sectors like energy and materials, um, consumer staples and utilities are all moving into the improving quadrant as, as potentially moving into the leading quadrant here. Um, you know, you're talking about energy and materials and consumer staples and utilities moving at the same time um, typically suggests stagflation, right? It's a time when you're, 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 you're seeing inflation, but you're seeing really low growth. So you're seeing the demand for the defensiveness, if you will, of staples and utilities, but you also need that inflation protection of energy materials. And the sector that is being the source of funds for all of these, as you see in the lower right here, is the technology sector. Now, as you mentioned, the large cap technology names that have a ton of cash in their balance sheet and generate a ton of cash, um, you know, those are going to hold up much better. But it's the mid and small cap technology names in particular that are going to be a, a bigger source of funds, I think, for as, as investors need to reposition their portfolio. And then the next chart I wanted to kind of bring up here when we're talking about earnings is even though um, these large cap names might put up some pretty good earnings, I think people should understand that the expectations are quite high. And so I have up here the NASDAQ um, earnings expectations chart, just looking at consensus. And we can see for the um, for this fiscal for this fiscal year, the growth expectations on an earnings per share basis are close to 13 percent. And for next year, it's close to 19 percent. And so understand that while these numbers that we might see um, will be pretty good, the expectations in the Nasdaq are really, really high right now. And so I think that is something that we have to kind of bear in mind that that's that's the multiple. Um, if you can look at it here, the price earnings multiple in the Nasdaq is close to 29 um, right now. And what that's telling you is that um, people have really high expectations of what's going to happen going forward. And we can see the multiple. If if we do achieve those, the multiple does come down as we grow into that multiple. But that's a, that's a big source of problems. And then the last one I wanted to put up here really quickly is just the Russell 2000. Again, we're only 100 stocks into a 2000 stock index. So it's it's tough to really put a lot of you know credence into what we're seeing because we haven't seen that many names. However, excuse me, if you look at it, this is the growth number. This is not the surprise number, but the sales growth for the Russell 2000 so far is nine down 9%. The earnings growth is down 17%. And that's pretty much negative across the board in every sector. That's really, really bad picture. That's not the kind of picture where you want to be owning a lot of those stocks. And so I think that's something that people have to, to kind of understand here. Um, and then the last one I want to, leave you with as um and then transition back to you tony is the factors that are working in the market right <clears throat> and we can see that market capitalization is the best performing factor that's large cap working low volatility is working really well as people are demanding safer stocks and we can see on a year to day basis now value is outperforming growth um by about almost 300 basis points. And I think that would probably shock quite a few people right now. What do you think about the factors, Tony? Yes, uh, Rich. From the factor perspective, this is we start to definitely see a shift uh, from uh, now, uh, from the beginning of this year to now. At the beginning of this year, that we continue to see the growth uh, stock outperforming the various stock. And uh, starting, um, I think, the beginning of this month when Federal Reserve continued to a uh, whole like a hawkish tongues over the uh, in, in, interest rate policy that investors uh, actually start to move more defensively over aggressively by positioning their position. I think allocated their capital into the defensive uh, uh, sector and simultaneously the also the dividend and value uh, stock versus the growth stock. And especially when we actually look at the growth stock perspective, we are referring to a, the large cap growth stock, which in my opinion would actually continue to show the strong um, revenue growth and earning per share growth because of the minority power they uh, and on, also the network effect that they created. This is some very, very difficult to change unless um, some major uh, event happen. But from the small cap perspective, both revenue and earning per share growth would continue to suffer based on the interest rate uh, issue and simultaneously the, cons uh, the consumption behavioral from the retail 
investor and consumer, this is uh, no doubt will be the case. The inflation will continue to actually to hold down the demand from the um the the consumer, especially the recent hike in the gas price, could really slow down maybe the uh, incoming uh, transportation and tourism. This is a very apparent with a lot of data actually coming in to show this is the do we see that start to see uh, actually to solve the demands for the people to actually to travel even uh, for both the spring and summer now this is actually would hurt in, uh, in the economy overall uh, uh, certainly the recent actually an ending announcements that uh, what you have seen from the small cap, uh, apparently, Russell 2000, it's not just a transitory uh, phenomena. I think it's going to continue through the rest of the year, might actually go um, even worse than what market can actually anticipate, uh, given the current uh, inflation remains so resilient. And it's going to remain resilient simply because the inflation right now is actually caused by the high commodity price, this, as we just showed the recent uh, rotation graph, like commodity materials and also the uh, energy remained uh, to be so strong and it will get stronger. That's, it's actually telling the investor that inflation is not going anywhere. It's not going to uh, soften, even maybe from the relative perspective, as long as the inflation, like uh, the maybe the percentage change might actually getting lower, but what really consumer really consume will be the absolute price of the gasoline, right? Maybe the, right now, um, at, actually, I think in average, just in Illinois, in Chicago, the average, um, I think, price per gallon is roughly about $3.95. Uh, That's actually way, way higher. And, and if even though you might just increase another maybe 2 or 3% from the inflation perspective, People continue to use that number, but we are actually indeed paying for right now roughly about four dollar per gallon rather than uh, just a two percent, <laughs> two percent increase per gallon. Now this actually is relative to the salary or the income increase. If actually the salary or wage increase can offset the inflation, that's okay. Consumer could be actually better off, but inflation, uh, wage uh, growth, actually, or is softening. That's actually telling up right now. We start to see the divergence. This is why the now the high inflation will start to actually kick in and hurt the employment, and especially given the time that we are actually in the era of the AI and artificial intelligence. Now the general AI would actually evolve faster and quicker. Because which actually could cause the the productivity for the corporation increase significantly, and every time when in historically when we actually uh, saw this kind of a productivity increase and sharply, that is going to cause the unemployment issues. Now, in like what we have seen in um, year nineteen ninety five when the internet uh, started to actually to emerge and a lot of people uh, haven't really realized the powerful until now today. So uh, internet is everywhere, but back to 1995, people might think the internet could be also a bubble, right? Now, now this is, it actually take time uh, between uh, almost five years, 1995 to uh, year 2000, when we started to see the dot com uh, bubble uh, burst it. It actually took roughly five to six years for that to happen. Now, now today's like with the introduction of the general AI or chat GPT last year, we actually just actually at the beginning phase of this kind of early adoption. So any this this uh, disrupted innovation emerge, it's in a uh, ripple effects over the employment would start to become more apparent to people, especially in the large cap companies. We continue to see the large cap corporation adopt the general AI to, to certain extent, what they call adopt general AI to increase both productivity, but simultaneously, continuously to lay off people. A central, uh, for, for instance, like um, and Citibank, 
continue to restructure their uh, human labor force in the era of a uh, gender AI. And what they really plan to really continue to see will be to leverage the gender AI's capability to replace some of the functionality of the labor. Now this, with this like large cap corporation, US corporation continue to embrace the gender AI technology. I think small companies would have to actually embrace this gender AI slowly to, if they really want to compete with the large corporation within the society. Now, with this kind of a two coupling effect to the unemployment and simultaneously with uh, commodity driven inflation, which will actually squeeze the buying power of consumer and raise the cost of capital of a company simultaneously, we will start to see as this, I think, decreasing demand from the consumer. This is, could eventually leading to maybe the hurting of those small cap companies, which might have some difficulty to generate the revenue or earning growth, or you spend the custom, customer base internationally as what those large cap corporations can do. This is what has been uh, really concerning to the market, I think, lately. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Tony, on, on all those fronts. And I, I think that that's going to be um, certainly um, the, the most important thing as we as we here we are on, on April 22nd. And this week and next are going to be the two busiest weeks of earnings. We're going to get a lot of earnings from those tech companies. We're going to hear a lot of commentary. I mean, the stocks have been performing not necessarily based on how the headline number has been, but on how companies are talking about the rest of 2024 and how that plays out. And the most successful companies that we have seen in terms of stock performance, at least, have been the ones that have been soonest to cut people, right? They've been, <laughs> yes. a lot of the tech and, tech and investment banks that have put up some pretty good numbers were the ones that were the soonest to fire people. We haven't really seen them um, coming back to hire. Um, on campus here, we haven't seen the companies coming back to hire at the pace that they we're hiring just a few years ago. Um, and so I think there are some signs that uh, that the labor market could be tough for consumers at, at a time when they're also facing, as you mentioned, higher costs, especially food and gasoline, which is um, a big portion of most people's budgets. Um, so I think that is certainly something to uh, to consider. But you're right, there's a, there's a disruption, there's a transition going on here um, in terms of um, AI and its impact. Um, and, and large caps companies are certainly going to have um, a competitive advantage in the early days of that um, as the small caps um, maybe don't have the resources to try to keep up with that um, early in, in the early going. But I think to me, as we look over the next two weeks, that's going to be the biggest um, and most important thing to, to pay attention to is the message that we're hearing from, from the different companies in the different sectors of who's doing well, who's not doing well, and what we're seeing and what we're not. Because on the one hand, we heard early on the banks like JP Morgan and Bank America telling us that from what they see, the consumer looks okay. But then we see the transportation companies like a JB Hunt come out and tell us that the market looks really, really poor. Um, and so that certainly gives some sort of uh, com you know, commentary, if you will, on the demand for, for services versus the demand for goods at the very least. Um, and now as we kind of go into tech earnings, we're going to get a, a you know probably even a, a much more nuanced and close look at at what that demand for services really looks like because you know the consume the uh, consulting companies um have come out and told us that they're not looking to hire which tells you that those particular services aren't being demanded so what services do people really look for right here and what is it going, that's going to hold up the economy and pay those salaries that can pay these higher prices um so um what any any last words for us because I know you know, macro matters. We, we talk about we always want to focus on the macro that matters. And we're kind of going into a, a couple week period here when it's the micro that might matter even more than the <laughs> macro. Um, but as we've seen in the last week or so, um, even in a micro period of earnings, the macro does matter. And this, this level of interest rates, the inflation that won't go away, the stubborn um, higher for longer Fed rates, mm -hmm. um, this is a big, mm -hmm. big piece of what's going on in, in the market still uh, mm -hmm. and that we have to can, kind of contend with. Um, and so um, any last thoughts that uh, of how you uh, are trying to think about this market, Tony? 
Yes, uh, Richard, I try to echo what you just say right now, even though it's actually too early to say <laughs> right now that the cost cut uh, driven earnings that actually helped the uh, U.S. corporation, which actually announced the earning this quarter to bid, um, will still be the main story for the Q1 financial results as the, the coming weeks actually come in. And the trend does, uh, thus far does, however, help to explain what earning bids. Now, but the that doesn't necessarily help to actually to for the current high equity variation to hold up here, especially right now the market has priced in the high growth for S and P company for next year, especially the Nasdaq one hundred as what you just show. The market has become so optimistic, and as what we have seen, market continue to remain to be overly optimistic about what the macro factor could really hurt corporate earning. I think the investors, especially institutional investors, should remain vig or stay vigilant as rich way you continue to call vigilant. And this is one maybe uh, final question that I would have for you. Like last month, uh, you make a really like, nice call that the yogurt actually might actually break out. Now from and later on, we did actually see the yield, the, the uh, long term uh, 10 years yields actually did break out to certain extent. What would be your anticipation for the year, 10 years uh, yield going from here? Richard? Well, I, I still think that, um, you know, I, I'm of the opinion that it's not going to happen instantly, but I think that the, those 10 year yields are going to move to the high fours closer to 5%. I think. Um, and I'm not just looking at that technically. I'm looking at that fundamentally. I'm looking at the fact that there's a lot of paper that has to be issued um, and and looking at where the demand can come in from for that paper. Um, and, and we don't see any slowdown in um, the fiscal spend, if you will, or demand for fiscal spend. So a lot of, you know, it's not like we can, we're going to see a, a material change of that. And so again, the, the largest foreign buyers just either don't want to or can't really pay these um, these yields that they were paying in the most recent auctions the last few months, um, and they're going to demand higher higher yields. Uh, I think banks are showing you um, that they um, can't or won't um, be active participants at the at these levels, and so I think we're you're going to need to see higher higher levels because more people that you you just see it in the flows and you see it in the um, the commentary that um, U.S. savers, U.S. retirees are very happy earning 5% in cash. And so to, to induce them to move further out the curve, it, it's not going to take, it's not going to be a lower yield that's going to get them to move further out the curve, especially when we're seeing inflation move higher, because the, of course that's the risk, right? What's the risk of sitting in cash and waiting, um, you know, and, and, and trying to, instead of locking in that yield is like, you're going to um, ultimately see that inflated away. And so I think all those things kind of, to me, point to the fact that um, we're going to see higher yields. And I think, you, you point out the raw industrials, you, you look at the, a lot of people when you talk about commodities, immediately they want to go look, they want to go look at the oil price, which has been um, a bit of a geopolitical uh, football as kind of things are getting kind of punted back and forth here. Um, but I think when you look at at a lot of the commodities for the things that, that really matter for people, you look at a lot of the industrial metals, um, they're definitely moving higher. You look at prices of, of coffee, even things like that, and gasoline, as you mentioned, um, these are things that, that people are spending money on every day and they are going the wrong way when it comes to price. Um, and, and then, of course, at the, at the raw industrials are, are moving higher, too. Um, I just think inflation is going to be persistent here, which means rates are going to have to stay stay higher. And this incremental supply on top of that just leads to much higher yields, which means that we're going to have to get much lower multiples from here, which means earnings have to carry the day. And I think for a number of stocks, earnings can carry the day. Right. When you look at the at the leaders, that's one of the reasons people feel safe in them, because they've been able to deliver good earnings. The, the bar might be high, but we're in that kind of disruptive, disruptive sort of phase where maybe the big, you know, that the leaders can continue to deliver. But for the ma vast majority of stocks, that's going to paint for, uh, a pretty challenging market, I think, for people. And you can argue that that's a stock pickers market. The problem is you can't have and when you're picking stocks, you can't only pick two stocks. And then right now, the Magnificent 7 is down to, I think, the Magnificent 2, and maybe it's Magnificent 1, depending on what, if NVIDIA holds the level, the support level today or not. Um, right. it's, it's it's really, um, 
you know, there, there's some, there's certainly some technical challenges in, in a lot of different markets out there right now that I think we have to be careful of. And, and, you know, portfolio managers that we've seen that in the options market, they, um, we see that in the, in the demand for, um, options insurance, right. And for put options, et cetera. Put option. Yeah. 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 And, and vo- investors are not bailing out of their stocks. Instead, they're choosing to hedge. You see that in the flow of options. You see that in the VIX index, et cetera. Investors yes. are choosing to stay invested and to hedge. Um, and in some ways, that's a healthy sign for the markets. Um, but that tells you that that if the hedges are in place, that tells you that you know there, you know there there is another wave of selling if the news continues to get worse. I'm not suggesting it will, but that you know we just have to understand how the market's positioned um, as we come out of earnings. Yes, uh, certainly. Now um, th- we actually have seen started to see that the VIX. Uh, increase and uh, significantly just last week and we may actually quite high this is a, will become an unprecedented story for most of the investors including both of retail and institutional investors i uh wish that uh, in- investors remember this old saying is sell in may and go away as we approach into this earning seasons yeah i think you're absolutely right and tony i think on that note it's probably a good place to leave it that um, I think we probably would all, but we're both kind of agree that that might be a, a little bit uh, better plan here going forward. But um, we will come back again in in a couple of weeks to uh, to recap what we're hearing from the earnings and what we're hearing from these stories from the companies and and what that might mean for the for the broader economy as we uh, as we um, enter May and go into the summer in, in in a lot of different ways. So with that, we'll leave it. Tony, thanks again for joining me on Macro Matters. Well, uh, we'll have to get together again sooner than we did in in this last stretch, but it's always good to talk to you. Yeah, always uh, glad. And especially the, like uh, uh, after maybe uh, the end of the semester, so we will actually have a more of the resource and information to share with the audience of Macro Matters. That sounds good. Um, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, and if you can join on, if you want to join on YouTube, you'll be able to find that on our website to see some of the, the charts that we shared. Otherwise, um, continue to like, share, and subscribe um, on, on any podcast app that you listen to. Thanks for joining Macro Matters. Thank you.